quite often you'll probably notice that Robbie is not here. He has to go work on other people's boats. Finally this week I have him back. I have my husband back. I have my worker back. We can finish up this project that's been kind of going on over several weeks. The two-person job was simply tightening down the bolts through the stanchions and the deck. The real question is who had the more difficult job? Me sitting out frying in the sun, or Robbie inside baking in the heat having to hold his arms up to the bolts? Anyways, now we had stanchions again, so we could finally begin to make the lifelines, also with materials that we've been carrying around on board for some years now. We needed to roughly measure out how much rope would be needed on each side of the boat. Imagine like four inches, maybe even a bit, about a pound width, yes. So I have my rough length, and first we're going to be putting a symbol on it. We're going to be putting one of these beauties that we've been carrying for years. Dynuma has 12 strands, so you want six on each side, six strands on each side where the rope passes, so it, the splice looks equal and neat. Two, four, six, is that it? We prefer making lifelines with high strength rope as opposed to stainless wire because it allows us to customize it however we want it to be. The rope is lightweight, it's easy to store, and finally, it feels nice to the touch. We installed this the same way on our previous boat, and we were really happy with it then. After Robbie locks the rope together by passing itself through itself twice, he just needs to tuck the bitter end in, creating a little bit of a finger trap with the fit. To make this a nice taper as possible, we're gonna remove a few of the strands, then, then pull, it, pull it through the, the, the main line. He likes to remove one or two strands way up near the eye right away to get a nice tapered end result. Although it's not necessary to remove so many strands if you're worried about strength. We do a nice pull and that goes in. And now I can taper the rest of it. So in goes that tapered tail. That's a smooth taper. We can uh, put a whipping to the last splice. This is overkill for lifelines. We could have gone with two sizes smaller. <laughs> Now we'll only be able to work with this one end of the line out here on the deck to make the second eye splice. Just a little extra chafe guard. These are heat shrink that we're gonna use as chafe guard. They, they do squeeze through. Here, I am just, woof, this guy's really hot in the sun. The purpose of this is to loop it into itself. Yes. Twice. So that's the first loop. Second loop. Three. Twist it, so then when you finally do put this one in, it will really twist itself in the right direction. It's kind of 
hardest thing is to get the yes. loop into itself. It's a little hard because normally I have a little tape and I tape this thing. I should just tape it. But then the tape becomes hard. Mm. I don't like the Well you did it before without the tape. I watched another sailing channel show this splice more clearly. They show a nice way to open up the strand so that you don't have to resort to using your teeth, like Robbie does. We have reached that stage where the jaws of Nice and tight. Came out perfect. The deck is really hot. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at these two fish They're like hanging out. Oh yeah, look at them, they're really hanging out together. Exactly. Probably man and female, yeah, they're definitely mating. It's definitely a mating ritual going on. Like I said, it's flexing his fins. That's mating for hey, sure. Hey baby, get close to this. He's all colorful because it was the mating season. Look at that. The blue tail and the red. Reminds me of somebody. He's just swimming and I'm coming like, hey. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. You get some of this fin. We were hurrying now, trying to get out of the sun as quickly as possible. Just a couple more lifelines to go. Believe it or not, but our rudder shaft and tiller projects were moving forward. We found a heavy duty bushing to help keep the upper portion of the post in place. Wobbling on the upper portion of the post is what caused the attachment point to shear in the first place. The bolts were fitting on now. That was nice. Next task was to build the tiller head, starting with a piece of stainless steel cut from a huge old propeller shaft using the metal shop bandsaw. The shaft was then milled down into a rectangular prism and blue ink brushed on to mark where it would need to be cut and drilled next. They drilled the holes where the tiller head would be assembled using stainless steel bolts. Robbie and the workers at the shop sprayed lubrication as the holes were drilled and countersunk. Countersinking would allow the bolts to be completely flush inside the tiller head. The guys at the shop cut the prism in half, and here Robbie found some scrap metal to assemble the second part of the tiller head attachment that allows the tiller to pivot up and down. Robbie learned how to use the milling machine. Milky lube everywhere. What a mess. It is done. We're just gonna round off the corner to help the slides move up and down. of a Thor's hammer type thing. Yeah, I have to readjust uh, the And height. then this is its, that is its lid. <laughs> <laughs> the guy made the, the world, because I made it really well, so the guy made the world for me. And the boss guy came and he saw the world, he's like, you did a world? And me and the guy were like, yeah. 
He's like, that's it, you hired. Like, he's like, if you can wear like this, you, you can end up like that. That's a little bit late of an April Fool's joke. Yeah. With the chiller head on now, we just needed to bolt on the bearing and to start thinking about where to find a nice piece of wood. The bearing was very much key to keeping the rudder post stable and secure. For the first time on this vessel, the steering was feeling smooth as butter. While we finished constructing our steering system and looking for a way to get an engine working on our boat, I made myself a nice little project to stop things, including our dog, from flying off the deck. I was trying to do this all in one length of rope, but I realized the uh, my piece doesn't fit enough rope on it to be able to pass through the tow rail, so I have to do it in a couple of sections of rope, usually two sections. Pass it through, tow rail, knot it. Buying pre-made netting was out of our budget, so instead, with a total of about $7 worth of rope, I made some safety netting within a couple of hours. What's this? Yeah, this. This is my hot morning wood job. So this is gonna be our pillar with some luck. This was a length of heartwood from Chappas from a local wood shop that had cut the piece and then it warped into a perfect curve to create our tiller. We would need to cut a slot in this very hard piece of wood. Well, that's to be that thickness and then the inside uh, the both outside corners would have to be rounded off yeah. with a chisel I have to round off the inner corner so it slides in here yeah. Clack. After a couple of minutes of sawing it was time to take a break already and to protect Robbie's lower back and then eventually we would move into the shady spot in the parking lot. Sharpening all the chisels. Have to find a piece of wood with a beautiful curve on it. So now we have a, a tiller that's too long, obviously. I, I think we're going to reduce it by at least a foot. It's about 25 bucks. And now we have to do something with it. We have to carve it, shape it. It's going to be fun. After the subject matter of the last video, I just wanted to make very clear like, on one hand, there's my dog's particular behavioral issue and on the other hand there's entire packs of dogs that i have no control over more or less so i can say my experience packs of dogs in mexico are pretty chill but then there are also packs of dogs like i've been chased around here on my pedal bicycle and they'll come and they'll run after you they probably won't bite you but you you never know for sure two things I have to train my own dog and then I kind of have to deal 
with something I'm not in control of, which is other packs of dogs. To address his behavioral issue, I think helps a lot, obviously. He starts barking at the other dogs. It attracts more dogs to the situation. If he were quiet, calm, listening to my commands, there would probably be no packs of dogs coming to bark at us. This is the reality of it, so I'm concentrating now on getting him to be less reactive. For the task of training him to be less reactive, I came across some people who have more expertise in the field of training dogs. I'm not a dog trainer, I only have my experience with dogs growing up in the house and him. Now, I, I had never actually heard of a slip lead before doing a little bit of research online. In the comments of the last video, I actually got some feedback that helped. Someone mentioned a prong collar. I looked that up. I hadn't heard of that before and I didn't want to start with something so aggressive. Maybe that would work as well, but what actually that led me to was finding out about slip leads, which I was able to, before buying a slip lead, just make one on my own with some of the leftover rope that we have on board. And that worked really well immediately. It's all about communicating what it is you want. Me using the harness, it was communicating to Choco more and more that he was in control of our walk. He was the leader. The feel of the pressure on his chest is it makes him feel like he's pulling us, he's leading the pack. That's precisely what you don't want, of course, when you're trying to train your dog to not pull and to not <laughs> be the one deciding where to go on your walk and who to bark at. And so the slip lead immediately worked on Choco, still pulling a bit when we meet the dogs. And I'm still working on trying to make that very clear, like what it is I want when we approach other dogs. I'm, again, I'm not a professional. I don't have experience with this other than having watched other YouTubers, other people, dog trainers, no dog trainers around here. There's a really good channel. I might put a link down there in the video here. Yeah, really effective. I, I had never heard of this method before and I kind of wish that I had known about it years ago because I think that would have really helped even from a younger age for him to understand like what a walk is for, that we're not supposed to be barking and, and scaring other animals when we're on walks. He is a guard dog. Choco's job is to guard the boat. And otherwise, when we're out on walks, I'm in control. Choco, sit. A little bit of a before and after you can see here. Here they are at the sign. Choco is walking a lot more calmly now. After giving some treats and walking with a big stick for a couple of weeks, the dog pack under the sign is also acting very much calmer now too. People have been asking a lot about uh, if I'm concerned about rabies from getting bitten and the answer is yes, I am concerned about that. I went and visited a couple of doctors and apparently the doctors in the area are not concerned about rabies. It's not an issue. It hasn't been reported in this area and maybe even in Mexico in general there was apparently a governmental program to eradicate the disease in all of Mexico. So. I am worried about it. But even if you could, I, I'm not sure you'd opt for the 10 shots that it takes. I, I wouldn't. I have to see I the would. dog foaming from the mouth. It, it, I am concerned enough that if there was a rabies vaccine available, I would go get it. But when I went to talk to the medical professionals here, they were like, no, nah, no, nah, there's no there's no rabies in the air. Come back with you foaming from the mouth. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, it's not funny because I, I am very uh, worried about it and it haunts my dreams. But. Yeah, thank you everyone for watching and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video and see you guys next time along the way.